For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sean Gibson, and I'm the headmaster of Canon Christian Academy. It's the kindergarten through 12th grade, the high school, that operates as a ministry uh, right here in this church. Prior to that, um, I was a youth pastor um, for about 15 years, and prior to that, bivocational for like 30. Um, the call that the Lord, I heard from the Lord was, was to disciple children and youth. It's, it's my passion, and it's kind of timely because this is the beginning of our vacation Bible school. It starts tomorrow, and it's going to be spectacular. It's called the Creation Station, and if you've got a child, you should register them today. If you know a child, you should register them today because next week is going to be the high point of their summer. It's going to be spectacular. It's going to be wonderful. And I highly encourage you, there's the bright yellow sheets out there and make sure you get enough. If you can pre-register today, it would be great because we usually have at least 100 walk-ins tomorrow. So we'll get started much faster if you can register your children now. So um, with that said, um, it shouldn't come as any surprise that this morning I would address you about children. Um, that's my passion. The most often quoted verse about raising children is Proverbs 22.6. Raise a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he shall not depart from it. Great verse. Powerful verse. But have you noticed there's a lot missing from that verse? What does it even mean, the way they should go? What does that mean? How do you raise a child in the way they should go? How is this even done? And then why did God say in the way they should go? Why didn't he say raise your children to be good or raise your children to be godly? Why did he say the way they should go? What is the, the, the deeper meaning of this phrase? These things are not readily apparent in the verse. But it's not to say that God hasn't provided them. We just have to look at the Bible in context. You see, less than 20% of the Bible is actually didactic instruction. The book of Proverbs is. It's instruction. The majority of the book, over 80% of it, is story. And it is in the story that we find all the details to accompany the verse. And so that's what I'd like to do this morning. In fact, this morning, I would like to hit on three points. And it's going to be the mission of parenting, the method of parenting, and the meaning of parenting. Now, before you check out, because some of you might be thinking, I don't have kids, or I'm not going to have kids, or my kids are grown and gone. And you might think that this message will not be relevant to you. I assure you, this message is for everyone in this room. In fact, you may find, I would offer, that this is one of the more important messages to us because it's one of the meta themes, one of the overarching themes of the scripture. So if you're ready, let's jump in. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through the end of the chapter. We're looking at the first parents, Adam and Eve, and their children. Verse 16, it says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and he settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city, that is Cain, and he called the name of the city Enoch after his son. Now to Enoch was born Erad, and to Erad he became the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech. Now Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. As for Zillah, she gave birth to Tubal-Cain, a forger of implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. Now Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Now Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain had killed him. Now to Seth was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. And then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, what we see here is the same parents, two lineages. 
First, we look at Cain. It's presented to us. It's the lineages of Cain. After he had killed Abel, it says that he left the presence of the Lord. That is a key phrase here. He left the presence of the Lord. He didn't have to. He was being corrected by God, and instead of receiving the correction, he ran. And so since he left God, he was looking for meaning in his life outside of God. And he decided to do that through his children. And so he had a son named Enoch. Now, Enoch means um, initiate or follower or candidate. And then Cain builds a city, and he names it after his son Enoch. Um, My wife was talking to me the other day, Dorothy, and she said, you know, if you know what you want your child to turn out like, it's pretty easy to figure out how to raise them. If you want a self-centered child who believes that they are the center of the universe, then you raise them like they are the center of the universe. You raise them like the world revolves around them, and you will have a self-centered child. And that's exactly what Cain did. He has a son, Enoch. He says, you're going to be like me. You're going to follow me. You're going to, to copy what I do. And he built a city. He said, and this is city, son, is yours. We're going to build a civilization, us. Now, they do a pretty good job. You see, when Lamech has his sons, you figure out one son is a raiser of cattle and foodstuffs. And so he's establishing agriculture and, and for civilization. The other son brings up the arts. And, and they are skilled in playing wind instruments and stringed instruments, and he brings forth arts. The other son, Tubal-Cain, he brings up industry and technology through developing implements of iron and bronze. They're doing an amazing, successful job at building a civilization. They're doing fantastic. In fact, we'd say Cain is on it until Lamech opens his mouth. And Lamech, whose name means powerful, has two wives, Ada and Zillah. Ada means ornament, and Zillah means shadow. Just in those names, there could be a study, but we don't have time. And he says, listen, you wives of Lamech, I've killed a man for wounding me. I have killed a child for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then I will be avenged seventy-sevenfold. He is extremely proud and arrogant and violent. So though that lineage is very successful, their hearts are cold and dark. So then we see that Adam and Eve have another child, and she names him Seth, which is an interesting contrast from Cain. You see, Cain means begotten. And Eve says, I, she, says, she names him Cain, but she says, I have begotten a son with the help of the Lord. But then with Seth, she says, for the Lord has appointed me a son. There's a huge paradigm shift there. Did you see it? Through the pain of her suffering, her paradigm shifts. Instead of it all being about Cain, she names him Seth, appointed of God. And that humility, that switch, must have been reflected in the parenting because Seth then names his son Enosh. Now, Enosh and Enoch, in English, they sound very similar. But in Hebrew, they're very different. It's it's more like Hanach and Enosh. And the meanings are completely different. Enoch means my initiate, my follower. Enosh means mortal and weak. And this was not a joke name. She wasn't slighting her son. She names him mortal out of of wisdom. Solomon was said to have more wisdom than anyone. In the end of his life, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And towards the end of Ecclesiastes, he says this. He says, pursue life with all of your youth, but remember, you will die and stand before God in judgment. Great point. In fact, from this point, we get a motto. It was, for centuries, it was very popular. It's in Latin. It's memento mori, and it means this. Remember, you die. We get a lot of great um, mottos out of Ecclesiastes. One was very popular a few years ago, comes out of Ecclesiastes, and it's this, YOLO, you only live once. And that's true, that comes straight out of Ecclesiastes, but they left off memento mori. You only live once, then remember you die. And it's through this kind of humility that we get a completely different product. Through humility, it says, Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. 
Pride and arrogance may produce worldly success, but humility produces faith in God. And so we see a a contrast between the two lineages of Adam and Eve. Success versus faith in God. And we don't have time. I'd love to go through. I mean, you can just keep going through the Bible, and there's story after story where this continues to play out. God actually calls Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he says, he makes a covenant with him. We call it the Abrahamic covenant. He says, I will make a great nation out of you, meaning I'm going to make a lot of people from you, and I'm going to give them a land. I'm going to make them a nation. And through you shall all the people of the earth be blessed. In that covenant was a promise of a Messiah, a Savior. This is a wonderful covenant. God says, I'm going to bring it through you, Abram. So he has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Now, the issue is that there's a contrast here. God had made this promise to Abraham, but he was getting old. And though he saw, he didn't see the promise being manifested. He saw him and his wife get way beyond childbearing years. So Abram decides that he's going to help God out. And he has a child through Hagar, the slave girl of his wife. And so God repeats the promise. Abram, I'm going to make a great nation of you, and through your seed shall all the people of the earth be blessed. And Abram has said, may Ishmael stand before you forever, saying, look, I know that, God. I know the promise, and look, look what I've done. I'm securing your promise. And God says, no. But Sarah shall have a son. Sarah's 90. He's 99. He had to receive that son by faith. So Ishmael represents works. Isaac represents faith in God. We have another contrast. And then Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau is talented and manly and strong. And Jacob's not. Jacob likes to make soup, okay? And so there's this contrast. And so Esau is everything that is talented and skillful, but Jacob has a passion for the birthright, for the blessing. And so we see a desire for the world versus a desire for the things of God. We see talent versus faith in God. Then Jacob ends up having 12 sons. And he has all these sons. And through the course of those sons being born, they're given names. And those names give a a lot of uh, insight. Jacob stole the birthright by playing on the blindness of his father and had to run because his brother was going to kill him. And God has a way of bringing yourself around to yourself. And so Jacob lives with his uncle Laban, who cons the con. And he takes advantage of Jacob's blindness on his wedding night and marries him off to his older daughter, who's ugly, instead of his younger, beautiful daughter, Rachel. And so just as Jacob kind of lived under the shadow of Esau, Leah lived under the shadow of Rachel, her beautiful sister. And so she was seeking value and worth through being good and religious, doing what any good Jewish woman would do. She needs to have a son. So she cries out to God and she has a son. Now she's invisible. He doesn't listen to her. He doesn't love her. He loves Rachel. So when she has a first son, she names him Reuben, which means God sees me. Now my husband will love him. I've given him a son. But Jacob loved Rachel. So then she had another son. and She named him Simeon, which means God hears me. God hears me. Now my husband will love me. I've given him two sons. But Jacob loved Rachel. So she had a third son. And she named him Levi, which means God loves. And she says, God loves me. Now my husband will love me. I've given him three sons. But Jacob loved Rachel. And so the fourth son she has She names him Judah, which means praise. She says, I will praise the Lord. She woke up. And through her children and through religious works and through doing what the culture said is right, she was trying to establish her life. And then finally she realized, that's not going to happen. I will receive the son in faith. And so out of all of the 12 sons that the covenant could have gone through, it doesn't go through Reuben or Simeon or Levi or the sons of Rachel or from the sons of their handmaidens. It goes through Judah, the child received by faith. This continues to go. Eli doesn't raise his children. He's more concerned about his son's happiness than their holiness. And so they are, they're moved out of the way. And the prophet of God is not going to be Eli. It's going to be Samuel, who was given up by his mother Hannah 
in suffering to serve the Lord. And so it's not happiness, it's faith in the Lord. And when they go to, to, to anoint the king, the king who would carry on this blessing, Jesse brings all of his sons. And, and, and Samuel looks at him and he goes, man, that, that boy is handsome. He's got to be the one. God says, no. Well, that one's tall. No. Strong. No. Great personality. No. God says, no. Man looks to the outside, but God looks to the heart. And so Samuel says, Jesse, you got any more sons? He's like, no, I, I got, I've got this little emo kid out watching the sheep. I mean, he's like, he's all into music and stuff, got the lock. And, um, and no, he's, you don't, I don't think you want him. He's like, we're not eating until I see him. And they bring in a David, and God says, that's the one. He's the man after my heart. So through all of this, we see, what does it mean to raise a child up in the way they should go? It's not what we have thought. It's not what we focus on. It's not about them getting a good education. It's not about them getting a good job. It's not about them getting secure financially. It's not about them doing good works. It's not about them having a great work ethic or having good intentions. It's not even about their religious works. It's not about their talents or their gifts or their sports ability. It's not about their beauty or their looks or their personality. It's not about those things. It's about faith in God. And I was tempted to say, you know, those are all good things. But actually what the Bible teaches is when any of those things get between a a child and the way they should go, they are wicked and evil things. For what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world but lose his soul? So you could raise your child to be a billionaire. They could go Olympic gold, double platinum. They could be famous. They could be happy. And if they die and go to hell, who cares? The way a child should go is in a relationship with their God. That is the mission of parenting, to raise our children up to know God. Well, if faith in God is the mission of parenting, what is the method of parenting? Well, I can tell you this much. It's not about talking to them. If parenting was just about telling your kid what's right and wrong, let's face it, we'd all be like ninja varsity Jedi parents, right? We, we know how to tell our kids what's right and wrong. But you see, it doesn't do us any good to sell to our children a product we've never used. It doesn't do any good for us to tell them to be something that we are not. Do as I say and not as I do has never worked. It didn't work for me, it didn't work for you, and it will not work for our children. You see, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to model the gospel. If we want our children to have faith in God, we need to be radically saved. We need to love truth. We need to know it. We need to live it, and then we can speak it to our children. This is called modeling. And modeling isn't what we've been told. If I was to say, how would you plan time with your kids? Usually when you, you hear about parents planning time with their children, it's, they're gonna go play ball, we're gonna throw the ball, or we're gonna go see a movie, or we're gonna go on vacation, and we're gonna, we're gonna have this time together. That's not modeling the gospel, that's entertainment. People in the Bible, that wasn't what they considered parenting. In the Bible, what they considered modeling was living out the difficulties of life, of birth and of death and of marriage and of parenting in accordance with their beliefs. In fact, even their holidays, which is an adulteration of the word holy days, were the feasts. There were seven feasts in Israel, and they're the gospel. There were three spring feasts, waited 50 days, there was Pentecost, and then were three, there was another cluster of three feasts in the fall. And these speak of the one who was and is and is to come. The spring feasts were Passover, 
Jesus was crucified on the Passover. It was the days of unleavened bread when he's buried in the tomb and the, and the celebration of first fruits, Jesus rising from the dead. So the first set of feasts is about his death, burial, and resurrection, the first coming of Jesus Christ. Fifty days later, Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit is poured down upon the church, and the church is ignited. It's the one who is. Jesus works on the planet right now through his people. And then the last cluster of holidays was trumpets, the return of Christ, the second coming, with a trumpet sound, the day of atonement, which is the day of judgment, and tabernacles, where we live, we tabernacle with God forever, the one who is to come. Even their holidays were the gospel. We must model the gospel. And by the way, this works. I am... I have a very clear memory when I was four years old. We were parked in front of Whitney's Drugstore in Silver City, New Mexico. I know the exact parking spot. I just saw it a few months ago, and I know the spot, not because it's a beautiful parking spot, but because something amazing happened there. You see, my mom and dad were parked there, and they were fighting in the car, and my mom started crying, and I lost it. I just went berserk. I was screaming, I lost it so bad, my dad had to get out of the car, he had to come around, he had to control me, he had to get me to settle down, and he looked me in the eyes, and he said, son, I will never fight with your mother in front of you again. You will never see your mother cry. And he was faithful to that word. So fast forward to just a couple years ago. My oldest son, Christopher, is going to get married, and he's getting marriage counseling in Colorado, and he calls me, he says, Dad, I have a question. I said, what, what is that? He said, I don't get the whole role, you know, the, the whole husband and wife roles and the submission thing. I don't know how to work that out. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I never saw you and Mom fight. You were always on the same page. How does this work? I said, well, that's simple. I said, we never fought in front of you. He's like, what? I said, well, you know, we would run crosswise to each other and we'd give each other the look. And we would excuse ourselves from the room and we would leave and close the door and then have a discussion in whispers. Because it doesn't do you any good to go across the door, shut the door and scream. You can hear through the door. So we would be having a discussion in whispers and if it got too emotional, we would separate, we would pray and we would come back and whisper some more. And we would do this until we got on the same page. And when we were on the same page, we'd open the doors, come in arm in arm, and let you know how life was going to be. And he goes, oh, I get it. You see, modeling works. And don't get me wrong, I have a horrible temper. My dad has a horrible temper. But my dad showed me, he modeled for me, that you don't make a mother cry in front of her children. And I learned that lesson. Now, there is another weapon that's very powerful for us in the method of raising our children in the way they should go. And it's called Christian community. Hillary Clinton was quite famous for her statement that it takes a village to raise a child. Do you remember that? She was on the right track, but she missed. It doesn't take a village. It takes a Christian community to raise a child. What's the difference? I did not want a Muslim speaking over my sons. I did not want an atheist speaking over my sons. I did not want a homosexual speaking over my sons. Why? Because they don't believe the gospel. I wanted people who love Jesus speaking over my sons. That comes in the church. Well, aren't you narrowing the the group of people that can talk to them? No, it's a church. Have you ever looked at a church? It's the most eclectic grouping you'd ever want to see. You've got long hair and you've got short hair. You've got cowboys and you've got homies. You've got ex-cons and you've got ex-cops. You've got freaks and you've got normals. I mean, it's just a weird group of people. But they have something in common. We're all trying to get closer to Jesus. And this is the definition of beauty. Beauty is diversity in harmony. And you don't get a more diverse group than a church. We come from all different backgrounds and races and, 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 and cultures. 
And yet we come and we're in harmony because of the power of the Holy Spirit moving through us. That's who I wanted over my sons. Well, why do we need that? Because there comes a time in raising a child that they kind of grow deaf to your voice. And you need other voices that speak the same thing you believe over your children. I remember one time picking up my youngest son, Michael, from summer camp. He had a great time at summer camp. I show up. He's got this huge grin on his face. He's so excited. He comes running up, Dad, Dad. And he holds up this piece of paper. He says, do you know what this is? And I look, and I see that it's his name written in Greek. He goes, this is my name written in Greek. My cabin leader wrote it. And he folded it up real carefully and put it in his pocket and ran off. And I thought, I wrote your name in Greek, and you didn't give a rip. But he writes it, and whoop de doo right? But it wasn't that I was jealous. Honestly, I was excited because this man took a week off work so that my son could go through summer camp and learn about Jesus. And he was somebody that my son looked up to and loved Jesus, and I loved that. I remember sending my sons over to the Merchek's home. Maybe you guys remember the Merchek's. Mr. and Mrs. Merchek, they used to greet at the front door. And they were going over to help with the yard or something, and I remember them coming home going, Dad, did you know Mr. Merchek's a lumberjack, a real lumberjack? I'm like, no, really? Yeah, and we think they're royalty. They have this big parchment in their hall, and it has all the family crest going all the way back to Europe. I'm like, wow, who knew we had such celebrities in Las Chavez? <laughs> what they didn't know is that there's at least a half dozen pastors who got saved in the floor of their living room during a Bible study. You see, I didn't have them over there by accident. I wanted men and women of God, of faith speaking over my children. Because you see, there's nothing more important than raising them in the truth. The role of the parent is to raise their children in the way they should go, in faith in God. But in Galatians, it says that we turned our sons over to tutors and to stewards until they were of age. And in Galatians, it says that God has appointed teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service. Who do we have teaching our children? Who do we have speaking over our children? They're to be believers that we select carefully. The mission of parenting is to raise our child up in the faith The method is modeling it personally and through a Christian community. And then finally, what is the meaning of parenting? God in the word has established four institutions. The family, the church, government, and the market. Each of these institutions has been ordained by God to perform a certain function. The family is to provide parenting. The church is to prepare and to educate and train. The government is to protect from the wicked. And the market is to generate wealth and provision. Each of these institutions reflects a facet of the face of God. For God is our provider, like the market. God is our protector, our king, like the government. God is is our bishop, the overseer of our souls, our rabbi, our teacher, the church. And in the family, God is our Abba, our daddy. You see, the purpose of parenting, the actual meaning of parenting, is to communicate the father heart of God to our children. I have... I always have had an amazing capacity to wreak more havoc and destruction than I have the ability to repair. And let me give you an example. When I was around seven or eight years old, I came up with a game, a brilliant game. It was called Throw Rocks at Truck Bumpers. It was a great game uh, because the road next to our house was full of river cobble, which were the perfect throwing stones, endless ammunition. And trucks provided the most wonderful target because the bumpers were right there. They made a great sound when you hit them. And they were moving, kind of like a poor man's skeet, right? And so it was a great game. And one day, while I'm playing throw rocks at truck bumpers, um, I, I get educated about something. 
I found out that the elevation of a truck bumper is identical to the windshield of a Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Because what had happened is I had let go of this rock and I'd let it fly. I'm going to make a point. I know it. When all of a sudden a Carmen Ghia comes speeding between me and my target and, and it hits my rock and the windshield shatters, car screeches to a halt, this woman comes jumping out. She about yanks my arm out of its socket. She's screaming about something about how her interrupting my game could have killed her. And so she wanted to know my address and my phone number. Well, it was the 60s, so I dutifully recounted off my phone number and my address because there was no stranger danger. It was the 60s. And she left. And I did the only thing that I could to resolve this issue. I went home and I took a nap. I was awoke from my nap by my dad, who had evidently had a call from the arm yanking lady. And so we had a long discussion. He talked to me about physics and he talked to me about basic economics and the judicial system. And pretty much the long and short of it was he was going to have to buff out that star in the windshield and try to keep that person happy until he could take allotments out of his checks until he had enough to pay for the windshield. And that was a pretty good plan because my allowance was 20 cents a week and by the time I could pay for the windshield, the Carmen Ghia would be dead. And so really what happened was I broke it and my dad fixed it. He paid for what I couldn't pay for. Do you see the modeling of the gospel there? You see, my parents were not great theologians, but there's one thing I can tell you. My dad loved me, and he forgave me, and I knew he would give his life for me. So when somebody told me that I had a heavenly father who loved me, would forgive me, and died for me, it made sense, and I received the truth of the gospel. Now, we get the gospel, we're on the receiving end of the gospel when we're young and we're innocent and we're trusting. But as we grow, we start to have questions, somewhat more cynical questions. If God is so loving and if God is so powerful, then why is there so much wickedness? Why is the world so evil if God is so loving? And to answer this question, God gives us a glimpse, a peek from the other side of the gospel and he gives us children. You see, we have a child and they turn our life upside down. They break everything that's important to us. They spend all of our money. They don't care whether or not we sleep. They eat all of our food. And if they manage to make it past 10 years old, they start believing that we're idiots and they would rather trust the wisdom of their peers who've only been alive a third as long as we have. And in the darkest night of our soul, when our heart is torn and bleeding and our guts are all wrenched out because we've been in some conflict with our child, God asks a question. So if you had to do it all over again, would you still have them? And we answer, well, of course. Why? Well, they hate you. <laughs> because I love them. Exactly. Oh, I get it. And in fact, he takes us even deeper to a deeper truth. He says, and, and what was that that you prayed to me when your son was suffering? Oh, you probably pray the same prayer. God, please, let me be sick, not them. Please take this suffering off them. I'll suffer. Let me suffer instead of them. They're so young, he doesn't understand. God, let, put it on me, not him, please. Not his life, my life. Oh, wait a minute. That's what you did for me. You suffered in my place. You took my pain. This is deeper theology, isn't it? I've always said marriage is kind of like Bible school and children are like seminary. 
But at this point, we could get arrogant and think that we love like God. So he shows us that there's a level that we have not yet reached. And maybe you've had this question too. So, would you give your son to die for those who hate you? Absolutely not. We get offended. Would you die for someone who hates your mother or hates your father? No. I would knock their teeth in. Ah. That's because you don't really understand love yet. It's called divine love. The word is agape, and it means self-sacrificing, selfless love. You're not there yet, but I will get you there. That's how I love. And so God teaches us through parenting. The gospel. Scholars say that there are two witnesses to the existence of God. There is the world, the creation, and there is the word, the scripture. The world is considered general revelation, and the scripture is considered specific revelation. You see, when we look out at creation, it draws us to the conclusion there must be a creator. This is too fantastic to be an accident. And then when we read the scriptures, the the actual character and nature of God is explained to us through specific revelation. When we start living that revelation, I think we come full circle. And then we know God in reality. It's kind of like this. If you tell a child that the chili pepper is hot, they have knowledge that the chili is hot. They have gnosis, knowledge that the chili is hot. You told them. But when the child puts it in his mouth and bites into it, then he has epinosis, experiential knowledge. And when you couple experiential knowledge, epinosis, with gnosis, you have understanding. You see, through our lives and through parenting, through living out the scriptures, we have understanding of the gospel. So the mission of parenting is to raise our children in faith in God above all else. Nothing can touch it. Their athletic, academic careers are meaningless outside of their faith. The method of parenting is to model faith in God in front of our children, personally and through a Christian community, to ensure that our children see Christianity, taste it, smell it, touch it. And ultimately, that's because the meaning of parenting is the gospel. That the one who brought us forth is the only one who can fix what we break, is the one who will pay for what we owe, and loves us more than himself. And he died on a cross to prove it. Whether or not you had a good relationship with your dad isn't the point. You have a perfect heavenly father. Family is the gospel. What's left is we need to take our daddy's hand. Amen?